So yeah, I'm Mark Jan. This is uh, Gerben. We're from uh, from Edens. We're a startup uh, based uh, here in Amsterdam, actually in the Keizersgracht, so very close by. And um, we've been working on applying deep learning to medical imaging for about a year and a half now. And uh, well, we think we've achieved some nice results that we are eager to show uh, to share with you and uh, explain a little bit about how we're doing that. And uh, perhaps uh, you can provide us with some feedback as well on maybe how we can still improve it. So what are we talking about here? Um, well, what we're working on is um, detecting early stage lung cancer. And lung cancer is, starts in lung nodules. And lung nodules are very small deviations in your lung tissue. Um, you can see the picture, um, which is an axial slice, meaning a horizontal slice through somebody's body. Uh, you can see two lungs and with a lot of, um, I don't know, bronchiae, arteries, uh, heart, uh, spine, uh, fat, uh, and lung tissue. And at the red arrow, there is a lung nodule. So, as you can imagine, this is actually quite difficult to detect. And, but it's important to detect them because um, once you are able to find them, you can treat them. And then, if you can treat people in this early stage, uh, they can recover and they'll live, which is good for them. And uh, by the time it's very easy to detect uh, lung nodules, when, the, when they've grown into a cancerous mass, it's often too late. So uh, you can still treat people, but they'll likely die. So there have been studies on um, how, uh, how to, uh, to, to, to use this knowledge to, to improve um, uh, the t detection rates of lung cancer. And the best way to do that is to screen everybody who is at a high risk uh, of lung cancer, which is unsurprisingly people who have smoked a lot. So everybody who has smoked uh, a lot of cigarettes and is older than about 55 years old uh, should be screened using a CT scan. And the first thing, of course, you have to do on that scan is detect that there is something wrong and then you can decide what to do with it. Um, so far, people do this, right? Radiologists, they, they take their scans, they look at them and they try to find these, these little deviations. Um, the maximum sensitivity you have as a person, as, an, as a trained radiologist who does this for a living, is about 80%. Meaning, you miss about 20%, one in five. So, yeah, if you're the one in five that they miss, that makes you unhappy. So, the question is, um, can we do something about that with software? Um, there's a technical challenge here as well, uh, besides a clinical one, is that um, finding these things is actually pretty darn difficult because the, the data set that you're looking at, one scan, is a 3D volume of, let's say, 50 million to 100 million voxels. So it's 100 million features that you have to analyze to figure out if there's something there. Um, there's an example of a, of a lung nodule. Actually, it's quite a big one uh, on, the, on the page as well. So the data set that we're using to train on is about five, five terabytes. Um, and uh, since these things are so large, uh, you can't just fit them and uh, throw in a, a complete 3D volume at one end and just output a label at the other end and expect your network to train. It just doesn't work like that. Uh, and even if it would work, it would take an awfully long time because there's so much data. So the question is then, how do you do this? Uh, well, of course, the first thing you try is when you have a lot of data, then you buy bigger servers, right? So this is the last one we bought. Um, actually, these uh, GeForce GTX 1080s came in yesterday. Uh, so we still have to put them into our server. So we're hoping that by using one server with eight of these things, um, we'll improve our, uh, our training times a little bit more. Um, you also run into some practical problems with these things because it turns out when you put one of these in a rack uh, at a hosting party, um, it will melt their, their power cables. So uh, you have to upgrade all kinds of stuff to be able to, actually you can put one of these servers in a rack that's meant for a 44U rack. So you learn as you go along. Okay, um, that was my introduction. Uh, I'll hand over to Gerben to do more detailed technical stuff. All right, thank you. Um, so the way we tackle this challenge is uh, we created a pipeline um, uh, with a series of uh, stages. Um, there is a pre-processing stage, a localization stage, a post-processing stage, and a boosting stage, and I will explain each of these. Um, but the most important uh, thing to remember here is that the output of one stage uh, is used as the input of uh, the next. So let's start with the pre-processing stage. The pre-processing stage uh, takes in a series, a scan. Um, and it, uh, sometimes there are multiple series, and then we can pick uh, which one is the best. 
So uh, some scans may have a higher resolution or better quality. And then we will pick that one instead of other scans. And this is the way uh, CT scans are processed. Uh, sometimes there are multiple versions of them. And the next step is uh, reading in that scan. And that uh, scan has been, uh, uh, follows the DICOM standard, which is uh, a format, a standard um, for medical images. And so we have to, um, yeah, we read that scan in and uh, we perform various, various consistency checks uh, in order to see whether we can handle that scan and um, whether it has been made correctly, uh, there has, whether there hasn't been an error um, in, uh, in saving the scan. So um, then when we have read the scan uh, and it uh, passes all the checks, we, can, we then scale it to a common resolution uh, so that every scan has uh, the same resolution because these scans vary in resolution as well. Uh, and so we use um, uh, the resolution seen on the screen. Um, so that the network that we put um, the scan in um, doesn't have to um, work on different resolutions. Right, so then we have the pre-processing stage. The next step is to, to use that scan that we came out of the pre-processing, uh, which is basically a NumPy array now uh, in Python, and put it in our localization network. The localization network uh, is a network that detects nodules. At a, and basically what we want to achieve with this network is we want a very high sensitivity. And what that means is that we want to find as many uh, of the nodules that are present in the volume, and we don't care at this stage about any false positives. We want to minimize them, of course, but we want to achieve very, very high sensitivity, like 97% of the nodules' um, sensitivity. And what we train on uh, is, is a label uh, that is as big as the scan. And we annotate on this, uh, on this label, we annotate the, the nodules as, um, as bounding boxes where they can be found. So the label is basically a one where there is a nodule and a zero where there isn't. And so the output of the network is a probability map of whether for each voxel, whether that voxel falls uh, inside of a nodule. So let me explain this localization network a little bit more. So what we want to achieve is that we want, um, we don't want uh, to specify a size of the volume that we put into the network. And the way we, we can achieve that in TensorFlow, which is the framework that we are using to, to uh, create our deep learning networks, uh, is by uh, defining a dynamic shape. And you can accomplish by this by uh, using non uh, as, a, as a shape uh, size for, for each of the spatial dimension, x, y, and z. And that's, uh, that's making the network not care about the size of the volume that we put in which is uh, very important because these scans uh, vary in size. Also, uh, because we want to apply it to huge volumes, we cannot use certain network features like strided convolutions or max pooling because that would reduce the input and we want the output to be as large as the input because we want a probability map of where the nodules are to be uh, the same size as the input volume. A last trick that we use is because if you use a normal convolutional net, uh, we, wouldn't, we would have to use a lot of layers if we aren't loose, allowed to uh, use strident convolution or max pooling. So what we use is dilated convolutions. And those are basically convolutions uh, which have zeros uh, in the filter in, inserted. And you can see here on the image that um, this would be a normal three by three convolution. 
and um, with dilated convolutions, basically the white pixels here are zeros, and so you create a much larger convolution, but you don't have that many more parameters or even the same amount of parameters in this case. And so the whole network can be seen as one giant convolution, therefore can be applied to any size volume, like we wanted. Furthermore, we use the ResNet architecture. And this is an architecture that uh, has been successfully used in many problems. Um, the main reason, I'll just explain first what the ResNet architecture does. Um, I'll assume that uh, convolutional nets are known at this point. So, um, basically what the ResNet architecture does is when, when you have a convolution uh, applied, you add it to the input that it is applied on. So here you can see that these weight layers are uh, convolutional layers. And then there's an activation function in the middle there, a uh, rectified linear activation function. And you take the input, you put it through those convolutions, uh, but you, at the end, you add the convolutions to the input. And this way, um, the gradient flows better to each layer in your network. And therefore, you have, don't have problems with exploding or vanishing gradients, which is a common problem in a very uh, deep, large uh, networks that, have, that we use. And by using this ResNet architecture, we alleviate this problem. Um, also, you can see a code snippet here in TensorFlow. And this shows you how easy is, it is to set up um, this kind of residual network architecture in, uh, in TensorFlow. Basically, um, the image that you see on the left uh, has been translated here to code. And you can see the two convolutions here with the rectified linear uh, activation function in the middle, and here the copy is made um, to the input, uh, is, ad is added to the input there. And most of our network um, contains 2D convolutions, uh, but the whole network is actually a 3D network. Um, and because we don't use as much context in the, th in the Z axis, we don't uh, do a lot of 3D convolutions, but most of the network is kept two-dimensional. And the way we do this is when we have a 3D volume, we reshape it to be a 2D volume for the time being, and then we apply the 2D convolutions that we want. And then afterwards, we reshape it back to 3D again. And the way we can do that in TensorFlow is using the reshape function. And we basically, when you have um, a normal input to a 3D uh, neural network, it would be, um, the dimensions would be batch um, Z, Y, and X, and the channel dimensions. And we reshape it to join the batch and the Z axis. And so we basically make it a 2D volume by seeing all the, all the slices in the Z dimension uh, as, as, as separate inputs to the 2D convolutions. One other trick that we use is, um, is weight normalization, and this has actually been developed by Tim Salimans, uh, which is a scientific advisor of our company and works for OpenAI. Um, and he... Um, he made weight normalization to be a more practical, easy to implement um, method to, to, uh, to tackle the exploding or vanishing gradient problem that I talked to you about before. Um, basically, in most nets, uh, when they get very deep, the gradients get either zero or they explode. And by using a technique called batch normalization, you can... You can um, well, alleviate that problem, but it's very expensive to to run on large networks. By using weight normalization, you can also fix this problem, and it's much easier to implement. What we do is, when we have weights of a convolution, 
we redefine them in terms of a magnitude and a direction. And here you can see the formula of that. And this is the new weight. And we, we normalize the, the old weights, the normal weights, uh, by dividing, dividing them by the magnitude. And theref therefore we have a normalized vector here. And then we add an extra scale factor in front of it. And so we basically, um, we basically deter define the parameter space in a different way, which helps, um, which helps the gradients flow to different layers better. Also, this is much easier to implement and it distributes over a lot of GPUs uh, very easily. Some other tricks that we use are data augmentation. We train on uh, linearly scaled and translated inputs of the volume, which, uh, which gives us a lot more data because we don't have a lot of positive data. There are not a lot of nodules, uh, lung nodules in, in a volume and therefore data augmentation is key to perform to getting good results. Also, we don't use very large networks. Uh, the amount of parameters isn't that large because we cannot afford it even though we have a massive amount of computing power. Uh, because the inputs are so large, it would take a lot of time to train a network otherwise. And so we use sl smaller networks instead of techniques like dropout. We initialize the network with uh, data that we train on, uh, which uh, gives it a much better performance because uh, when we we scale the weights according to uh, what the what the outputs of each layer uh, is, and we make sure that the output of each layer is a standard standardized distribution by scaling the the weights uh, proportionally. Okay, so now we have this probability map of the whole volume where the nodules occur. And we take the post-processing stage is where we threshold these, this probability map and determine for the connected components that, uh, that we have after the threshold operation where the center is and what the radius is of that connected components in order to get some statistics of that nodule. And we call these candidates. So the result of this step is a list of X, Y, Z coordinates, coordinates of all the candidates that we, f that we find. And because we focused on sensitivity, there will be a lot of false positives at this stage. So the next step, we want to reduce these false positives, and this is called boosting. It basically takes the output of the previous network, and it creates a patch around each candidate in the volume, in the original volume, and we train another network to determine whether this is actually a nodule or a false positive. And here you can see some uh, a nodule and an actual false positive. And so the network is asked to uh, differentiate between those two categories and therefore thereby we reduce the error that the first network made but we do not change the center anymore the center is determined by the first network so this step is actually a lot easier and faster to train These are the results that we got. Um, there's a Luna challenge, which um, is a challenge of determining, well, lung nodules uh, and lung scans, basically exactly what we do. And we got a top score. And at the right, you can see a frog characteristics of our classifier. And what that means is you, on the Y axis, you see the sensitivity and on the X axis, you can see the average number of false positives per scan, which is, is the amount, the average amount uh, of false positives. For example, at uh, one false positive per scan, 
we get almost 90% um, sensitivity. And that is already much better than um, a radiologist would do. I also want to talk about a little bit about a uh, recent Kaggle competition that had that uh, that is held right now. Uh, it's the Kaggle Data Science Bowl, and we are also competing in that Kaggle competition. Um, the Kaggle competition uh, is to predict lung cancer on a scan, so it's a little bit different from what we do because we want to detect lung nodules, and this um, this competition is to detect whether a patient gets cancer within a year. So that's a much harder problem actually, because you only have one label per scan. So that is very little label data. And also we only have 1300 uh, scans to train on and 200 tests, 200 scans uh, as a validation. So very little data. So what we did is we used our pipeline to detect lung nodules on these scans because um, it's very logical that lung nodules uh, means that um, is, an, is an indication of whether a, a patient has lung cancer or not. It is not uh, a guarantee because that many lung nodules uh, will not result in cancer, but um, a lung nodule may have characteristics of lung cancer. And so we train on these candidates that we get from our pipeline other networks to determine certain attributes of each nodule, like speculation and texture, which is basically how the nodule looks. Uh, speculated is like it has um, kind of tentacles in each direction. And uh, also the size of the nodule is very, very important in order to determine whether it's a cancerous nodule. Also, we add some extra attributes like X, Y, and Z location, and the distance to the lung border, which are also of great help in determining whether uh, whether something uh, whether a lung nodule is cancerous. And here you can see um, the model that we implemented uh, on top of uh, those attributes that I talked to you about earlier. And you, as you can see, it's very easy to implement. It's only a few lines of TensorFlow code, and that's, that's why um, we use TensorFlow a lot. It's a, a really good help uh, at what we do, and it basically has everything that we need. Um, so we, we fit a linear model, but we apply modern techniques like dropout and noise uh, on top of it. And because we have a lot of candidates per scan, we want to reduce all those candidates to a certain prob to one single probability. And the way we do this is take by taking the maximum uh, log loss over the candidates. So we, right here, you can see the reduce max function, which uh, is is exactly what that does. Um, it takes the maximum over all the linear models which are defined here. So we multiply the input by weights and add a bias and then take the maximum. And then with built-in function from TensorFlow, we can uh, calculate the cross entropy and minimize that. And so in only a few lines of code, you can uh, create powerful models that you wouldn't be able to create in other uh, frameworks. Okay, finally some comments. Um, well, deep learning is awesome for medical imaging. It's, uh, it's gonna revolutionize the industry and um, well, we're also, we, we are already seeing great results from it. And there's so much more to do and test out on these data sets that are huge. And that is, um, yeah, that's just, just great. These techniques are, uh, are essential to to creating um, the performance that we obtained. Also, the size and quality of our data is very important. As you can see, with the Kaggle competition, we only had 1,300 scans. If we would have half a million scans, there's no limits to what we could do with that. So, um, also, we 
you need to think really carefully about uh, how you design a model with TensorFlow because it allows you to do so much um, because it's it's a very generic framework uh, but you have to watch out for overfitting and uh, computability in our case because we have such huge volumes that we put through the networks that uh, we quickly uh, have problems that it will take up a lot of compute power and finally uh, there's a lot of papers on archive available uh, including those techniques like weight normalization that I talked about um, and they are a great resource um, in the deep learning community so thank you everybody